This is good sound. Thank okay, you. we'll go with this then. Okay, I'm uh, Commissioner Littell, along with me is Commissioner Benoit. Um, we are here in docket 2011-262, which is the follow-through on the 10 person complaint filed by um, Ed Friedman et al. In the smart meter case, let me tell you where I'm at um, in terms of what I'm going to do today. I have a long draft opinion. It's 62 pages long. Um, I'm going to hit all of the main points in it. I'm not going to. I'm not going to read the whole thing because that would take five to six hours. That said, um, I have. I provided it to staff. I provided it to Commissioner Benoit. Um, I don't expect that Commissioner Benoit has had a chance to review the whole thing, and I don't think it's coming up on. Um, him to read the whole thing or respond to it, but it is, I'm going to hit the main points. The points are obviously what we're deliberating. I'm not going to talk about all the factual support on a follow up that I'll provide, except that we make it into it in our further discussion for figuring out where we're coming out. And if you can't hear me, um, I think it'll be hard for me to effectuate this with you there in the back, but you can raise your hand or stick up your ear. I, I probably won't see I, you. In I the back. Really Okay, so in this case, there is credible scientific evidence to support multiple perspectives on the safety in particular of cell phones or mobile phones, but this case is not about cell phones or mobile phones, it's about smart meters. This commission's role is to evaluate and resolve this evidence consistent with the public interest under a long-standing statutory mandate to assure safe, reasonable, and adequate service and facilities. I find the record is clear that there is some credible evidence that there may be health effects associated with significant exposures to radio frequency radiation. But I caution that credible evidence of possible effects does not demonstrate a credible threat of harm to CMP's customers nor an unsafe utility practice. In this case, complainants and CMP's evidence serves to illustrate that there is scientific disagreement, particularly on the risk posed by cell phones, mobile phones, and other devices um, close to the human body. The World Health Organization is charged with assessing cancer risks through its agency, the International Agency for Research on Cancer, which is called IARC. I'll refer to them as the World, World Health Organization in my comments. The World Health Organization findings and other studies that were submitted in testimony of this commission suggest that there are potential risk of tumors in terms of glioma, which is a, a malignant cancerous tumor, and acoustic neuroma, which is a non-malignant tumor from radio frequency radiation associated with cell phone use and mobile phone use. A substantial body, like this commission, in my view, ignores the findings of an authoritative international body at its peril. I find the World Health Organization reclassification and research supporting this finding to be credible. However, this research and the World Health Organization classification as a potential carcinogen, possible carcinogen is their exact term, Focus on exposures from cellular phones and mobile devices operated very near the body and often next to the ear and head, as opposed to smart meter installations on the outside of buildings. For this reason, the cell phone exposure scenario is higher and different from exposures from smart meter transmitters operated most often outside a building from the utility meter location. Radio frequency radiation exposure from AMI smart meters typically is two to four and as many as five orders of magnitude and an order of magnitude is roughly times ten. So two to four and as many as five below those of cell phones, mobile phones, and other devices used close to the human body based on the evidence in the record. The power levels and frequencies of radio frequency radiation as between smart meters and mobile phones are similar, but the human exposure is markedly less from smart meters. It is a basic principle of toxicology that the amount of exposure matters. Measuring exposure and dosage often determines the level of safety. The lower the exposure, and therefore risk, from smart meters on the outside of houses and repeaters on utility poles does not support, in my view, of finding the AMI, AMI meters are anything but safe based on the current science. I find the exposure levels of AMI meters to be safe given our current best level of scientific understanding the credible risks posed by this technology. Therefore, assuming the incorporation of reasonable precautions for those with medical treatment recommendations to avoid such exposures, 
the deployment of smart meters is a safe utility practice and not a credible threat to the safety of CMP's customers based on the current best level of scientific understanding we have as represented in the record. However, in adopting this finding, I would also adopt low cost and limited precautionary measures recommended for those to ensure safe and reasonable service if customers are medically advised to avoid such exposures. That was my introduction and summary. So I'm now going to move through the body of um, the opinion in, in a little bit more detail that I would propose. First off, um, I would grant complainant's exception on page three that safe utility practice is to be is to consider safe as a standalone standard. I think that's fairly clear under the law court decision, and I think there. Their points well taken there. Um, on what safety means, um, I've thought a lot about this, and um, I should have started out by noting staff have had a lot of time to think about this and look at this too, and have done um, an outstanding job in this case, working with the parties and creating a very fulsome record. Um, and considering this issue, that language on um, safe and adequate utility service has been in our statute for nearly 100 years, at least in Section 101. What it meant in 1913 when it was adopted um, was clearly different than I think what we think it means today. Scientific knowledge of risk and cultural norms and societal expectations um, have changed. One example of that um, that I use by way of analogy and I'll return to throughout my opinion is how we deal with electromagnetic um, radiation primarily from high voltage lines. And in 1913, there was not a lot of consideration of that. Um, now, in the high voltage line cases, we deal with that. And that's because scientific information has been developed, um, some epidemiological studies, which are population level studies, that suggest that there is a risk of childhood leukemia from such exposures. And there's um, a good deal of detail I put um, from the record in the commission's prior report into um, my written opinion on that. For this reason, again, dealing with electromagnetic radiation, which is a different type of radiation than RF, a different part of the spectrum, from high voltage lines, um, we have adopted, in the case of the main power liability project, incorporation of a stipulation to follow World Health Organizations there, which include adoption of reasonable mitigation where there are low cost or no cost options that are available. And we've effectuated that in a butter cases, including the Curtis case and the Fournier case, where we look at particular levels of accommodation, whether low cost or no cost mitigation is available for that type of radiation exposure. And again, I have a good deal of detail on that in my opinions on page six, if you're following along. Consistent with the commission's approach in the NPRP case, the Curtis case and the Fournier cases, the context and purpose of the service in the facility require consideration. We have to look at the purpose of what it's intended to achieve. The type of utility facility or service define the parameters of the safety concern. If there's a potential safety threat, the nature of the threat, the concentration <laughs> and strength of the exposure, and the availability of alternatives and mitigation techniques are important to determine safety of the utility service and the facility. We've also um, had time to focus on what the law court meant, and in figuring out what they meant, I'll, I'll offer these observations in my interpretation of their standard. Um, I would observe that a credible threat to health and safety, which is the term that was used by the law court, does not mean any credible evidence of a risk or possible risk. That can't be sufficient to achieve a credible threat. If it were a credible threat, um, would mean things that happen regularly um, under utility services, credible threat of natural, dealing with natural gas or electricity service itself, which can cause fires if it's not handled properly. Um, credible is defined in the dictionary to include likely, probable, and presumptive. Likewise, credible threat is, inter is defined to mean convincing, capable, or persuading people that something will happen. It is one thing to find that there's credible evidence, which I do find in this case, and I'll get to that detail in a few minutes. But it's quite another to find that there's legally a credible threat, and that that threat of harm is in fact <coughs> credible, meaning likely, 
probable to result in harm. Thus, my interpretation of what the law court asked us to do is it's asked us to determine whether CMP smart meters are likely or probable to be a threat to their customers. And then I um, quote from some cases in Maine law and elsewhere, a credible threat, and um, the best research that um, I was able to do with the assistance of staff on what that might mean. Um, there is not a lot of direct um, case law on that in this context. There is another context, which is generally supportive of that, um, that interpretation. Returning to the commission's mandate, um, we are mandated to ensure the safe provision of utility service and facilities. Um, I think given modern standards, a safe utility service or facility is meant to include both short-term acute risks, the risks of electricity causing a fire or natural gas explosion, and also long-term chronic risks, the risks from electromagnetic radiation. Those risks that we evaluate need to be reasonable in light of the context and purpose of the service and facility, as well as the magnitude of the risk, that's the strength of the exposure or concentration, the probability of harm based on our best science, engineering, and medical knowledge, and the availability of alternatives to the service or facility, including mitigation techniques to reduce the magnitude and certainty of any potential harm. The utility and commission need to consider a broad range of reasonable operational scenarios and exposure scenarios that might be experienced when considering the utility practice and whether it's safe and what risk mitigation might be required to meet the safety mandate. These standards of safety may change with time, indeed almost certainly will as technologies and scientific understandings advance. Um, both the complainants and CMP offer different definitions of um, safety. I'll just note that I don't adopt either. I think they're both too stringent on opposite extremes. And um, give further explanation of that in, um, in my opinion. Um, I also note that um, the examiner's report postures AMI meters as a standard utility practice. Um, I think they may become a standard utility practice. I think that conclusion's a little bit strong, so I wouldn't um, support that exact conclusion. I think it is safe to say from our knowledge in the case that utilities that are putting in new meters now, particularly major deployments, are deploying different versions of advanced metering infrastructure and that the older meters are becoming obsolete, but I wouldn't quite call them a standard utility practice at this point. Now, um, as to our role, the Commission is primarily an economic regulator. Other state agencies have the public health and environmental protection mandate as their primary mandate. Nonetheless, the safety of the utility service is clearly within this, the Commission statute and the law court reminded us of that. That said, and I also want to know, I think a little bit too much has been made in the Commission's order of the lack of Commission expertise. Um, this commission staff are very capable we're regulators um, some we, ha we have some phd scientists but we're a mixture of economists um, lawyers engineers um, and we have the requisite regulatory um, knowledge to engage in regulation in this area just as we do emf from high voltage lines i'm now on page 11. Um, I know here, I, to the extent that there is an implication in the examiner's report that there may be federal preemption, I don't agree with that. I don't believe that the commission is preempted. This is a safety issue. Safety issues are typically not preempted under federal statutes. And I um, want to state that clearly, consistent with the commission's past precedent in, that, in this area. Now on page 12, as to the FCC guidelines, um, my view of the FCC guidelines is um, they probably the best determination in 1996 when they were um, looked at, um, but I think they're far too out of date to rely upon unless or until the FCC re-examines them. Um, the examiner's report also accurately observes that those are based primarily on thermal impacts and not on non-thermal impacts. Um, some other federal agencies have also made that statement. Um, and I find that the FCC standards don't take into account almost two decades of very relevant research. So I, I would reject any argument that we ought to rely exclusively on the FCC um, rules 
and standards. Um, that said, before I get to how I'm treating them, um, the Commission is encouraged that the FCC and other federal agencies during the pendency of this case um, have announced that they're moving forward with an examination of whether the FCC standard as well as FDA standards provide adequate protection. Um, and we're encouraged that um, the federal government will, um, will continue with that and make that examination. We are also encouraged um, that the research priority um, is being placed on the issues that are raised in this case um, at a high level by the National, National Research Council, which is part of the National Academies of Science, and by the World Health Organization itself. Their research agendas were introduced as evidence in this case. Um, extensive work is being done consistent with the science that um, we see developing here. And we're encouraged that both our federal regulator and um, our national and um, international health authorities are doing research and re-examining these issues, and that we'll see some potential advancement on those issues. Um, so, as far as the FCC guidelines go, I consider um, the evidence, a lot of which was um, put in, phrased in terms of the FCC standard, to be evidence, um, but not definitive evidence of compliance, um, because for among other reasons, the FCC guidelines are somewhat similar to some of the more recent guidelines that were put out by international standards setting associations, um, the IC and IRP. off the top of my head try to recall what that acronym is, but it's one of the important natural, uh, national, international standard setting organizations and the IEEE. Um, they both have standards. One is um, the IEEE is a little bit more in line with the FCC's. Um, the other requires a, um, a more stringent averaging time frame. And um, somewhat similar to over a dozen different national standards. So for all those reasons, I look at compliance with all of these standards together with the FCC standard. Um, I do not accept the testimony um, that was put in by Dr. Kumar and others that we reject all the safety standards as inadequate. Um, I think looking at all of the national and international standards, that gives us a relevant basis to go forward and, and make, um, make these judgments. Now as to the burden of proof, I've already noted, um, I think there is an issue um, the way the examiner's report is postured with a burden of proof. I would grant the complainant's exceptions in that regard. Um, the way I've written my opinion, it, do, it does not have um, that issue with a burden of proof. Um, but as a legal matter, I think it's clear under our statute and commission practice that the burden of proof is always on the utility. Um, the practice point is perhaps less important, but from a legal perspective, if you read sections 101, in section 301 of Title 35A, um, it's quite clear that the statutory construct puts the burden on the utility to, and this commission to assure safe utility practice, and I take that into account how I approach the case. Um, that said, neither is it reasonable to require CMP to prove a negative. I'm asking CMP to prove that AMI meters pose no risk under any scenario, however unlikely, um, it's not reasonable. <coughs> And an example of an unlikely scenario is probably a smart meter next to the ear, 24 hours a day. Um, that that scenario is not um, not a likely scenario. I spend a lot of attention, as does the examiner's report, which presents excellent analysis on comparing the relative exposure levels. AMI meters operate on similar frequencies and similar power levels to cell phones and mobile phones, and slightly different, but. Um, close to Wi-Fi in the home. Complainants and CMP actually agree on the basic lack of a distinction between cell phone and smart meter radiations in terms of quality and nature of the radiation. The relevant difference is in exposures, and the exposures concern the proximity to humans, the duration of use, and the extent of exposures, not the basics, uh, basic physics of RF emissions. Um, I repeat the table from the examiner's report which is table two in my draft opinion that shows the relative, um, it's, I should say it's some information taken from that, it's not the whole table. Relative RF exposure levels calculated um, on a peak basis between smart meters at one yard distance inside and outside a building, and cell phones held next to the head, cordless phones held next to the head, and access point 20 feet away horizontally at the same height, and a microwave emission in the house. Um, what these show, by and large, is that, as I said before, um, the exposure is two to four, and as many as five times 
higher from um, a cell phone held next to the head as an EMI meter. And that's a difference that makes a substantial difference. Two times would be 100 to 999 on an order of magnitude of four would be, I should say five, would be in the 100,000 range. So substantial differences in exposures. Um, complainant studies, to return to those, um, are substantial. They produce well-known and respected experts. Um, I accept overall the World Health Organization's reclassification as credible evidence of a possible risk, as well as in particular the testimony of Dr. Hardell, who's a professor at a Swedish university who specializes in epidemiological research of cancer risks, including particularly epidemiology on the subject of cancer risks associated with RF exposures. He's published over 300 peer-reviewed articles. Um, is respected internationally, was part of the World Health Organization body that conducted the examination, was asked to do that. In short, he's highly respected and regarded and presented credible um, testimony to this commission that I would cite. And I would credit that. Um, his testimony, though, I know is a little bit stronger than I would conclude, and his testimony goes a little bit beyond the World Health Organization finding. Um, he believes that there's actually a causal link, and I, I don't go that far in my findings. Um, <coughs> did the World Health Organization? I also found the testimony of Dr. Darius. I didn't ask staff how to pronounce it, so Lisinski. Okay, um, it was well written. Um, it was written testimony. He didn't have the opportunity to talk um, with us. It's credible, he carefully explains the scientific research to date and what it establishes and what it doesn't establish. Um, he's of course well credentialed and he also was one of the 30 scientists from 14 countries participating in the World Health Organization review of these issues. Dr. Lyshinsky explains what is meant by limited, limited evidence, which is what the World Health Organization found. Um, he, and I quote him here at the bottom of page 21, says that a limited evidence in the class 2b classification by the World Health Organization means that a positive association has been observed between exposure to the agent and cancer for which a causal interpretation is considered by the working group to be credible but chance bias and confounding it looks like I'm missing a noun here confounding I will insert factors but that's probably a misquote could not be ruled out with credible evidence um, this is important because it means there's sufficient evidence to cause a possible concern, but they couldn't um, rule out other factors as producing the epidemiological results and some of the um, animal results that cause them concern. Um, complainants don't properly, I think, that exponent um, largely ignores the World Health Organization classification. And I find that that is significant within the public health world for carcinogenicity in particular, the ability to cause cancer. I'm on page 23 now, which is the same point. However, um, the IR classification is as a possible carcinogen and acknowledges that there may be confounding factors. Exponents' use of the weight of the evidence test, um, which they heavily rely on, I find to be particularly uninformative and to lack scientific rigor, rigor um, and also to be fairly non-transparent. This weight of the evidence approach simply glosses over studies that, that they, um, as experts, do not agree with, rather than addressing the scientific specifics of the research and the studies or explaining their own assumptions in any detail. Um, therefore, it lacks scientific rigor and also doesn't let you know what the exact issues are that they're disagreeing with, so I think it lacks transparency. Um, I find it to be particularly unhelpful because then they, as experts, insist that complainant studies address all the uncertainties and provide a complete explanation for the physical and biological mechanisms to trace causation um, from the initial exposure to the actual biological effect or harm. So this is an example of what I find problematic. It's a scientific, sophisticated way of shifting the burden 
Um, in the record, there's there's an article by um, a David Gee of the European Environmental Agency, this is on page 25, um, who talks about, in the context of electromagnetic fields, dealing with the difficult issues, the scientific issues, um, which I list, in my opinion. Um, I commend this for consideration because I think Gee's framework is particularly helpful. It acknowledges that when we don't have full understanding, when there are a lot of variables and um, some scientific uncertainty, that we make decisions regarding safety um, without dismissing those concerns um, very carefully and, and not seek overly simplistic rationales um, or explanations. In their exceptions, the complainants note that while they discuss the Hill criteria at great length, and so does CMP, there is no finding in the examiner's support. Um, I, in my opinion, um, do go through the Hill criteria. Uh, the Hill criteria was first articulated um, in an address to the British Royal Society of Medicine by um, Sir Austin Bradford Hill in 1965 and later published in the Proceedings of the Royal Society of Medicine. It's well known and generally accepted as a useful framework in toxicology to assess um, unclear evidence of harm. Um, so I go through it in my opinion, looking at both the um, testimony that was submitted by Dr. Hardell and the counter testimony that was submitted by um, Central Maine Power relying on um, Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory, part of the Department of Energy, who also applied the Hill criteria and reached what appears to be on its surface a contrary conclusion. However, looking at both of this, the um, studies and articles in great detail, um, I don't think they're, they're necessarily contrary, and I credit both of them. The Lawrence Berkeley conclusions and the Hardell conclusions from the application um, can be seen together if you read the Hardell article closely and look at the actual results of his analysis, which were that there's a positive correlation when at that time he was looking at older mobile phone use inside and outside cars. There's a positive correlation for those who use mobile phones inside their cars, but he did not find the same positive correlation for the, for the antennas that at that time were placed on the roof very commonly in European cars. Um, the Lawrence Berkeley Laboratory um, review on the Hill criteria is very clear that they don't find a risk under the Hill criteria for smart meters, but does not opine on the use of mobile devices that would be the inside the car type of scenario that Hardell's analysis under the Hill criteria addresses. So in other words, I think this emphasizes the point that I made earlier, the magnitude of the exposure matters a great deal. And both of these Hill criteria um, analysis are consistent with supporting that and not inconsistent with each other. So I would adopt both of them. I would also note that um, even the evidence on which CMP um, puts into the record does acknowledge that there is some risk. And I think the debate is over the magnitude of the risk. This is on page 29, um, last paragraph. The um, by letter dated January 14, 2014, an article by um, Benson et al. Um, notes, and I think it's why CMP put it in, that they don't find any increased risk of glioma, which is a cancer, therefore non carcinogenic, according to this article. But it does note an increased risk of acoustic neuroma, which is a non malignant, non cancerous tumor, but nonetheless a tumor, um, as a result, again, of cell phone use. And the Health Council of the ne Netherlands report also um, is a review, it's not an original study, but um, that was submitted by CMP and acknowledged what it characterizes as weak evidence of causation, um, but weak nonetheless. Um, therefore, I think the debate really is about you know, how much risk and what this commission should appropriately find to be safe or not. So focusing on that issue, I move on to um, the actual testing, field testing was done in this case. First of all, our staff did a, a very good job of going back and mining the original manufacturer certifications that were done by Trillian, which is the manufacturers of these meters, to show that generally um, they test for manufacturing purposes, which they're required to under their governmental approvals within the range um, that they're supposed to test to. There was also actual field testing done um, by the Office of Public Advocate and by Exponent itself. The OPA conducted a test that found 
that RF levels were at 13.4% of the maximum exposure limit set by the FCC for its, um, for its general population. That was one of the results, the highest. Exponent um, concluded they weren't able to detect any, um, any RF signal. Now, complainants rightly point out that these studies were far from perfect. Um, worst case measurements were not made and peaks may not necessarily have been measured. For these reasons, I agree with complainants they are not definitive, but I think they nonetheless tend to confirm the initial testing results and calculations and the theoretical exposure estimates um, that they are not wildly off base. Um, two additional field tests were conducted by the Vermont Department of Health and by the Electrical Power Research Institute known as EPRI. These were on different meters that have, uh, operate on different frequencies and power levels, so they're not directly applicable to these types of meters, but they also um, confirmed general compliance. Um, and to my knowledge, um, AMI meters that are deployed nationally and internationally have tested um, as consistent with the various na national and international standards that have been adopted to date, and I think that's significant. So we move on to the bottom of 33, going on to 34. I therefore conclude because the risk um, is so much below the levels um, of much of the evidence that was submitted to us, um, even allowing the fact that, as Dr. Bond, who's a um, researcher with the World Health Organization, noted to Dr. Hardell in an email that was submitted, that there's that some hazards still may exist um, for smart meters. That hazard is so much lower than um, is shown by a variety of other devices that are commonly used in our society, um, making RF radiation for better or worse on a present modern society. That I conclude that CMP and the analysis by other governmental and standard organizations in the record and the studies establish the relative safety of AMI meters operating under typical parameters that are established in this record. And I know with some of the diagrams out of the examiner's report, they're very well done, the magnitude of those exposures um, in some detail. In my written opinion, moving up to page 37. I do note that complainants, I think, raised an adequate issue of what was identified as the worst case operating conditions. Um, Dr. Bailey, exponents expert, um, acknowledged that they hadn't um, adequately um, address that the worst case operating conditions. And so on this record, I don't think that worst case operating conditions can said to have been proven. Now we don't have any evidence, that's as an evidentiary matter. We don't have any evidence that CMP is anywhere near that worst case operating scenario, which would be operating at full 10% duty cycle from very large banks of meters in an urban environment. All the evidence in the record indicates that CMP is far below that 10% duty cycle and we don't have any evidence of large um, but if in the future um, that type of deployment would be um, would be adopted in Maine, I think it's something we need further evidentiary examination of. Um, and again, we don't have any reason to believe that, that it is at this point. This is a sufficiency of the evidence finding. It's not a legal finding or a finding of um, insufficient safety. page 40 now. Um, I do observe um, that there's some observations that I did not find helpful um, on both sort of sides of this case. Um, CMP refers to the complainants as a small but vocal group. Um, that's just not helpful when you're talking about eight to 9,000 um, <coughs> repairs and um, I don't think it, it helped us resolve, helps us resolve that type of case. Um, likewise, the complainants um, filed a bias finding against our staff. Again, I don't think it, it helps the case, and um, I don't support sort of either approaches, and they're just simply not helpful to the commission. This, the testimony the commission received in this case in writing in person shows a significant concern with these meters. Um, in assessing the complainants' health concerns and those who testified to us,
I am mindful that it is possible that those complaining here have a sensitivity that is clinically manifest without medical research as yet understanding the cause and effect. Um, the Austrian Medical Association has found that there is electromagnetic um, sensitivity is something that they diagnosed. The American Medical Association has not done so. Um, I make no finding regarding the validity or not of these types of symptoms or that type of diagnosis. I don't think it's necessary for us to do that. Um, again, I would cite the general approach of the World Health Organization, which also finds that the science is not um, adequate to support that type of um, syndrome, but notes that nonetheless these symptoms are nevertheless real and can be debilitating for those that are complaining of them. And I would cite um, Dr. Hartel, Hardell, who notes the appropriate scientific response to inconsistencies is to perform further studies with the goal of resolving these inconsistencies with a better and more comprehensive theory. It is not appropriate to ignore or discard, discard inconsistent observations unless there is a reason to conclude that the experiment was poorly designed or carried out. In this case, we have inconsistent testimony. Um, we have multiple witnesses who are Maine citizens, CMP customers who have submitted testimony regarding their experience. Um, these submissions are evidence. Um, I take these concerns very seriously of um, over 8,000 CMP customers. Um, the Commission's also received some expert testimony from treating physicians. Um, the patient symptoms are associated with RF sources and AMI meters. This is um, Dr. Rhea. Um, Dr. Rhea's clinical experience, um, as well as his study of this type of sensitivity, caused him to conclude that the exposure to RF radiation does have, does have health effects. Um, and we heard consistent testimony from a number of CMP witnesses. Now, I note that Dr. Rhea is generally, um, from the evidence in the record, well respected. He's both taught at medical schools, he's been a practicing physician, and he's written over 150 peer reviewed research papers. Um, in general, as a general matter. Um, I would therefore recommend and adopt that as with other phys physician recommendations, um, in the case of disconnection cases, where the commission has to deal with whether we are going to allow a utility to disconnect a rate payer, um, that we credit any treatment recommendations from a treating physician, a licensed treating physician, or a licensed medical practitioner to adopt what, um, whatever that treatment recommendation is. And I would allow for a smart meter with the transmitter off to be installed um, for that type of medical exception. Um, I do not agree with the suggestion, the way that I read the examiner's report, that a causal relationship is necessary to establish before we would take into account any type of reasonable mitigation. Now, in fairness, the examiner's report doesn't say that. That's an interpretation of it. But my preference would be to rewrite it to avoid um, any implication that that position is, uh, is endorsed. Um, to be specific, I believe that it's appropriate to consider low cost or no cost mitigation of risk where there is some credible evidence of the risk. But that credible evidence of the risk falls short of a likelihood of harm and short of credible risk of harm. Such consideration of reasonable risk mitigation is part of the safety determination that I think this commission needs to make under sections 101 and 301. Indeed, the commission itself has adopted precisely such an approach to risk mitigation in the MPRP proceedings addressing EMF, as discussed earlier in this decision and in the abutter disputes that have occurred for high voltage transmission lines under that case. Neither causality nor quantified risk are prerequisites for reasonable risk management decisions, particularly where we're addressing innovative technologies in the context of developing science, engineering, and medical understanding. It may be necessary to take limited precautionary approaches to safety in light of the uncertainty presented by scientific studies and new technology. I'm on page 46, sorry. Um, Therefore, I would make the safety finding, as part of the safety finding, I would mandate the CMP allow customers whose physicians identify the need to avoid such exposures 
the CMP would make a smart meter available to them with a transmitter turned off at no charge. I would limit this new exception to those with treatment recommendations by licensed practitioners who by law are allowed to prescribe medical treatments. I would therefore modify the Commission's previous orders to incorporate this reasonable low cost or no cost measure for those who submit documentation of a licensed doctor or medical practitioner's treatment to have AMI meter in a no transmit mode or turned off at their primary residence to qualify for such a no cost option to the ratepayer. And I would not disturb other provisions of the opt out order. Um, now, before I conclude, I know it is somewhat on the law court's remand to us. It's somewhat unclear to what extent they, the law court allowed a collateral attack on our earlier approvals and decisions. Um, my, um, my suggested solution would, um, would avoid those issues, so I think it's, um, it's not necessary to address those, um, but it may be. So those are my initial thoughts. I also have an appendix attached with a summary of some of the witness testimony that we received, and with that, I look forward to hearing Commissioner Benoit's views on the